Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the White House. Happy Thursday. Uh, before I go to your questions, I did want to um, echo an announcement that was made from Paris earlier today, I believe. Uh, the United States welcomes the announcement today from President Hollande that France will conduct airstrikes in Iraq. This is a significant contribution to the efforts of the growing international coalition to combat ISIL, and we look forward to coordinating closely with our French partners in the days to come. So given the uh, interest that there has been in our uh, efforts to uh, build this growing coalition, I thought I would note that at the top. Um, but with that, Darlene, I'll, uh, I'll go to your questions if you're ready to get us started. Um, can you confirm reports that are out there that the U.S. will provide $46 million in military assistance to the Ukrainian military? Well, there, um, I did read an Associated Press report uh, on that topic. Uh, that is, yeah, you must have a good source. Uh, President uh, Obama is looking forward to his meeting with President Poroshenko in the Oval Office uh, shortly. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to hear from both of them uh, about the discussion that they have today. The visit is an opportunity to highlight the United States' firm commitment to stand with Ukraine as it pursues liberal democracy, stability, uh, and prosperity. The two presidents will be discussing efforts to pursue a diplomatic resolution to the crisis in eastern Ukraine, as well as our continued support for Ukraine's struggle to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, we have announced uh, that $53 million in new security and humanitarian assistance uh, for Ukraine. Uh, which brings our assistance to approximately $291 million this year. Uh, that is in addition to a $1 billion loan guarantee that was announced uh, earlier this year as well. Uh, today's new package of assistance includes more than $7 million to be directed to international relief organizations to provide humanitarian aid to those affected by the conflict uh, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, it also includes $46 million in security assistance that will support Ukraine's military and border guards, uh, this is in addition to the $70 million in, in security assistance that we've previously announced uh, in Ukraine. Uh, all of this is a reflection of the support uh, from the United States uh, for the people of Ukraine uh, as they seek to determine uh, the future for their country that re reflects their will. Uh, it also reflects our commitment to standing with the people of Ukraine uh, as they confront this uh, incursion on their territorial integrity and their sovereignty. Uh, and on their efforts to build uh, a strong democracy and a strong economy for their people. Yeah, President Poroshenko was here today. He addressed Congress. He's asking for legal aid. Um, the U.S. is not yet ready to provide what he's asking for. Um, is, is some of the resistance to providing lethal aid, does that have to do with the ceasefire and perhaps wanting to see how long that will hold before you make a decision on whether to, to give Ukraine and sort of weapons to right. Well, I, I should point out that the security assistance that we are providing today uh, does include the kind of valuable equipment that will be useful to the Ukrainian military. Uh, it includes things like body armor, helmets, vehicles, night and thermal vision goggles uh, and other devices, heavy engineering equipment, advanced radios. Uh, it also includes counter mortar radar equipment uh, that could provide for uh, the protection of Ukrainian forces and provide warning of incoming artillery fire. So we're talking about some sophisticated military equipment that would be useful uh, to the Ukrainian military and to their security forces. Uh, the President, I believe, uh, as recently as just a couple of weeks ago, was asked about the uh, possibility of providing lethal assistance to the Ukrainian military. Uh, in the context of that answer, the President did talk about the strong ties. Uh, between the U.S. military and the Ukrainian military and our commitment to uh, supporting them. Uh, at the same time, we believe that the best way to resolve the differences between the Ukrainian government and the Russian-backed separatists uh, is for the Russian government to use their influence with the separatists to encourage them to engage in legitimate uh, negotiations with the central government to try to resolve their differences uh, and to do that in a way uh, uh, that reflects uh, a commitment to genuine uh, negotiations. Uh, we believe that is the path of, uh, of resolving uh, this situation uh, in the most enduring way. Uh, it is also is the way that is in the, clearly in the best interests of, of those Ukrainians right now who are living in a conflict zone. Um, if I could just switch to another topic. Sure. General Dempsey told the Associated Press earlier today in an interview that it's going to take at least three months to begin training and arming moderate Syrian rebels <laughs> and eight months to a year to field a cohesive fighting group. 
that seems like a long time. Can any of that be done sooner? Well, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, would have the best information uh, about uh, how the Title X authority uh, that we are hopeful that Congress will uh, pass today uh, will be executed uh, in pursuit of this mission to ramp up our assistance and training to Syrian opposition fighters. Uh, as you know, Darlene, the United States has been providing assistance to the Syrian opposition, uh, including some military assistance, uh, for more than a year. Uh, so there is uh, assistance that's already been provided that is already uh, strengthening the Syrian opposition forces. Uh, the President does believe, however, that uh, additional assistance should be provided so that uh, those Syrian opposition fighters can be in a position to take the fight on the ground to ISIL in their country. Uh, this is part of the President's determination uh, that it would not be in the national security interest of the United States to put uh, American boots on the ground in Syria in a combat role. Uh, so we'll be um, – someone, however, needs to be responsible, as, the, as our military planners have said publicly, needs to be responsible for taking the fight to ISIL on the ground in Syria. Uh, and that is why the United States is taking an active role in uh, ramping up the assistance that we provide to the Syrian opposition. Uh, those Syrian opposition fighters will have the backing of an international coalition of countries who are prepared to offer uh, military support in the air uh, in support of their ground operations. So we are optimistic that by implementing some of these changes that we can uh, improve the capacity uh, of the Syrian opposition fighters. Uh, but ultimately, the President believes that these Syrian opposition fighters need to be responsible for taking the fight to ISIL in Syria. Steve. If, if President Poroshenko is asking for heavy weapons, why not simply give it to him? Are, are you concerned about Russian retaliation or something? Uh, Steve, it's simply uh, the judgment of the President that the best way for us to resolve or for the situation in Ukraine to be resolved uh, is through negotiations between the Ukrainian central government uh, and the Russian-backed separatists in the East. Um, when asked this question in the past, the President has recognized or has acknowledged that it would be challenging to provide all of the military equipment necessary to try to level the playing field between the Ukrainian military and uh, separatists that have the backing of the rather sophisticated Russian military. Our strategy of supporting Ukrainians has been somewhat different, which is to provide them some economic and diplomatic assistance uh, and enough military assistance that they can um, uh, that they can sort of bring both sides to the negotiating table to try to resolve their differences through negotiation as opposed to on the battlefield. You mentioned the uh, French contribution. Is that the only other country besides the United States uh, joining in airstrikes? Well, uh, Steve, as I've mentioned a couple of times in the past. You know, the uh, announcements of commitments from members of this broader international coalition uh, will largely come from those countries. Uh, that is the way that those commitments will have the most credibility. And uh, after all, it's the decision uh, of the leaders of these countries to make about what sort of contribution um, uh, they can dedicate to this broader international effort. The President did, however, yesterday in his remarks talk about some of the commitments that we've received and have already been. Uh, carried out. There are more than 40 countries so far that have offered assistance to the broad campaign against ISIL. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, and France have been flying over Iraq with us for some time. Uh, France, in particular, has some sophisticated uh, intelligence and surveillance capability uh, that has already been put to good use uh, in Iraq. And the French President today announced uh, that, the, that France was prepared to take the next step of actually carrying out uh, airstrikes in Iraq. Uh, this is in addition to other commitments that we have received. Both Australia and Canada uh, have indicated that they are willing to send military advisors to Iraq. Uh, German paratroopers uh, have committed to participating in some of the training efforts that we have been talking about. Uh, Saudi Arabia uh, announced in the last couple of weeks that they would be in a position to host uh, uh, at least some of the training operations that would be um, that would ramp up the capacity of the Syrian opposition fighters. So what starts to emerge there is a pretty good picture uh, of the kind of broad international support that exists for this strategy to degrade and ultimately defeat 
destroy ISIL. And, and lastly, uh, the president sent out a tweet last night about keeping the UK together. What, what are his concerns about Scottish independence? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think what the president was uh, trying to make clear in the form of that tweet, uh, as he did in his previous comments on this topic, uh, is to make clear that this uh, vote is one that should rightly be decided by the people of Scotland. Uh, and they should cast a ballot uh, in uh, support of what they think is best for their country. Uh, the President, uh, speaking as the President of the United States, uh, talked about his belief that uh, the United Kingdom uh, is a robust, uh, strong, united partner, uh, and we want to keep them that way. Okay? Michelle? I'm a little confused about the lethal versus non-lethal aid to Ukraine. In the past, a senior administration official told us that there was a worry on the part of the U.S. of working this kind of proxy war against Russia. Is that still the concern, or what really is the point of helping the Ukrainians militarily, but only up to the point of lethal aid? Well, we do have an interest in making sure, Michelle, that the Ukrainian military isn't overrun by the separatists. The separatists have ac access to rather sophisticated military equipment uh, because, uh, as we have uh, said on numerous occasions, uh, the Russian military is actively supporting their efforts. Uh, there's, you know, NATO has produced uh, uh, photographic evidence uh, of this, despite the denials, the hard to believe denials of uh, Russian military and political leaders. So the fact is, Russian separatists are obtaining sophisticated military equipment from. Uh, the separatists are obtaining sophisticated military equipment from the Russians, uh, and we want to make sure that the Ukrainian military um, can't, doesn't get overrun. Uh, but at the same time, this is a conflict that will not be uh, satisfactorily resolved on the battlefield. Uh, there is an opportunity for, this, for, this, uh, for these differences to be resolved around the negotiating table. That's where they should be resolved, and the Ukrainian government will have the support of the international community. Uh, as they try to uh, engage these Russian-backed separatists in conversations, what we will do and what we'll continue to do uh, is call on the Russians to use their influence with the separatists to encourage them to engage constructively in those conversations. Russia's failure to do that uh, will put them at risk of sustaining even more economic costs uh, that could be imposed by the international community. It's time for Russia to play a constructive role in this process, uh, and the failure to do so um, has already led to uh, significant economic costs being imposed on the Russian people and on the Russian economy. And in all this time, including since the ceasefire, have you seen any step at all by Russia to do that, to use their influence to de-escalate it? Mm -hmm. Well, we have, there have been some indications that the, uh, that the Russians have uh, taken some steps that are consistent with uh, supporting the ceasefire agreement that was uh, that was reached a couple of weeks ago, but we have seen, uh, as we have in the past, some mixed signals from Russia uh, on this. And so, while there are uh, some uh, signs to be optimistic uh, about the direction that this is headed, uh, there's still a lot more work to to be done to implement the ceasefire agreement, to convene the kind of negotiations that will ultimately resolve the differences between. Uh, the Ukrainian central government and the separatists in the east. So you're still seeing troops massed at the border? Well, I, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense and other places about, uh, about what sort of, uh, what the latest assessment is uh, of the situation on the border and what the latest assessment is of Russian military involvement in this conflict. Uh, but, you know, what we have seen is a pattern of, of Russia continuing to allow uh, weapons and materiel to be transported across the border from Russia into Ukraine and into the hands of Russian-backed separatists. That's so still, still happening. Well, again, for for the latest assessment, I'd refer you to the to the Department of Defense. But you know what we have consistently seen is, uh, since the ceasefire agreement, we have seen the conflict de-escalate. That there are indications that the ceasefire is taking hold, but there have been sporadic uh, uh, exchanges of of fire uh, that indicate that that there's still some work to be done to implement the ceasefire agreement. And then the ceasefire agreement, of course, would not be the end here. That would rather be the beginning. Uh, because that would hope, hopefully, once the ceasefire was in place, open the door to the kinds of negotiations that would actually resolve the broader differences between the government and the separatists. Thanks. And you still don't see this as an invasion? And if not, why not? 
Well, because what we have seen for you know several months now uh, is the kind of activity in Ukraine uh, by the Russians that blatantly violates the territorial integrity of that country. Uh, there is an international norm at stake here, which is that sovereign governments uh, respect the borders of other sovereign governments. Uh, and Russia has acted in a way inconsistent with that international norm. And as a result, uh, the international community has spoken uh, with one voice uh, and taken uh, steps to impose economic costs on Russia for the failure to uphold those basic international norms. So, it's not so an invasion? well, what we've seen, Michelle, is you know is activity by the Russians that flagrantly violates the territorial integrity uh, of the sovereign nation of Ukraine, uh, and the international community has taken action to impose costs on Russia for that flagrant violation. Okay, let's move around a little bit, Justin. Yeah. Um, I had two things I wanted to ask about. The first one was on ISIS. Um, it seems to have been like a, a bit of messaging cleanup this week coming out of the White House, uh, whether it was Secretary Kerry on whether or not we were at war with them, Secretary Kerry about whether or not we were communicating with the Assad regime, General Dempsey on whether ground troops were a theoretical possibility or not, or Admiral Kirby on whether you really needed the authorization to do this train and equip program. Uh, we've heard statements that you've then had to clarify or walk back or however you want to characterize it. And so what I'm wondering is, if all these represent sort of differences of opinion within the president's team that are sort of manifesting themselves as people are asked questions about them, or if they're just instances of a big sprawling bureaucracy not all being on the same talking points. And if it's the latter, uh, whether you're worried at all that that's going to erode support, as it seems to a little bit on this last week for the president's plan to, to address ISIS. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'll say two things about that, Justin. One is something that I've said before, which is that I am confident that the senior members of the President's national security team are on the same page as the Commander-in-Chief. Uh, and I feel so confident in saying that, that, uh, that if you doubt that, that I would encourage uh, you or your colleagues to check specifically with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or the Secretary of State. I'm confident that they would confirm for you that they are exactly on the same page as the Commander-in-Chief. Uh, as it relates to some of the uh, uh, instances uh, uh, that you're referring to. The thing that we have said for quite some time is that these are complicated, complex issues, uh, and that the President feels a strong commitment to ensuring that we're communicating clearly with the American public with our and with our allies about what our policy is and about what our policy isn't. Um, and uh, it is appropriate for you and your colleagues to closely scrutinize uh, the comments of me and other, um, and the, the senior members of the President's national security team when they're doing interviews or when they're testifying before Congress. Uh, and we welcome that scrutiny. Uh, and I think what sometimes that scrutiny lends itself to uh, is a dissection of words to sort of probe the deeper meaning. Uh, and when we're talking about complicated issues, uh, it's natural for people to raise additional questions about those comments. But what I have said you know, throughout the instances that you have cited uh, is that the comments of Chairman Dempsey in the hearing uh, and Secretary Kerry in other settings uh, is completely consistent with the policy that has been laid out by the Commander in Chief. Uh, that continues to be true today. And then I wanted to ask about um, DNC Chairman Debbie Wasserman Schultz okay. in the context of the Politico story that came out. Um, I read it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Harry Reid said today that the future uh, for the chairwoman is kind of up to the president. And so what I'm wondering from you, since the article seemed to express some disenchantment at the White House with, uh, with the chairwoman, is whether you guys can re remain confident in her and whether you expect her to serve as DNC chairwoman throughout the rest mm -hmm. of the president's term. Well, I did read in the story the, the on-the-record statement from uh, my colleague Mr. Schultz here uh, expressing his uh, full support for the work of uh, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz is the chair of the DNC, uh, and frankly for all of the staff over the DNC. They have very difficult work, uh, and that is work that they do uh, outside of the limelight. Uh, but it produces important results for the Democratic Party, uh, and the President uh, is invested in their success and in the broader success of the Democratic Party. Uh, the, uh, Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz has a pretty strong record of performance to indicate uh, the the benefits uh, of the tireless work that she's been engaged in over uh, the last four years or so that she's been the, the chair of the party. 
Uh, over the last 20 months, she's traveled to 37 states and 99 different cities. Uh, just one more and she'll be into triple digits. Uh, under her leadership, the DNC has expanded their digital and technology staff uh, uh, who are providing uh, campaigns of all sizes, uh, cutting edge tools that the Obama campaign used uh, to great success in 2012. Uh, under her leadership, uh, the DNC launched the Voter Expansion Project earlier this year, uh, and they have voter expansion directors uh, in dozens of key states, including places like Georgia, Texas, Iowa, New Hampshire, uh, and others. Uh, she also has been hard at work, uh, working closely uh, with the finance staff of the DNC to pay off uh, debt that the DNC incurred in the context of the 2012 elections. Uh, the DNC incurred that debt to uh, assist Democratic candidates uh, up and down the ballot in all 50 states. Uh, President Obama benefited from those efforts as well. Uh, so he certainly has been pleased to see the DNC succeed in paying off their debt. Uh, and I now understand they're operating at a six or seven million dollar surplus. So uh, that doesn't happen by accident. It happens because of the dogged determination of, uh, of Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz and the rest of the staff of the DNC. Uh, like I said, that does uh, really good work uh, outside of the spotlight, and they don't get the credit they often deserve. Well, in the story, she said that she planned to stay in the position until January 2017. Is, since she's expressed that desire, do you guys expect her to be the chairwoman of the party until then? Well, she is. Uh, her term does run through uh, 2017. She was elected by the membership of uh, of the DNC, and uh, I would uh, I don't anticipate at this point any any reason to change that. Okay, Jared. You've responded to some of the uh, in the administration and current members' uh, reaction about ISIS. I wonder if you could respond to General uh, Retired General Mattis's uh, testimony yesterday about specifically not taking things off the table and saying that this is a, a forecasting. I know the president's talked a lot about hammers and nails. Are you concerned at all about putting away the hammer and letting the nails do what they will? Uh, Jared, I, I have answered a version of this question before, but let me, uh, let me take another shot at it. Uh, I did, well, let me start by saying I did not see General Mattis' uh, testimony, so I, I'm not in a position to react to him directly, but uh, I can react to uh, the, the contention that you've raised about sort of the wisdom uh, of taking things off the table when it comes to our military strategy. The one thing that the President has taken off the table uh, is deploying uh, American military personnel on the ground in Iraq and Syria to serve in a combat role. Uh, the President does not believe, as he mentioned in his remarks to uh, the men and women at MacDill Air Force Base yesterday, uh, he does not believe it is in the national security interest of the United States for us to get dragged back into a ground war in Iraq and Syria. That means you will not see columns of American tanks rolling through Iraq with the goal uh, of taking and holding territory in Iraq. If there's anything that we've learned over the course of the last decade is that providing for the security of the nation of Iraq is not something that the United States can do alone. For all of the tremendous capacity and bravery of our men and women in uniform, uh, they should not be in a position where they are providing security in Iraq for large uh, segments uh, of Iraqi territory for the Iraqi people. This is work that the Iraqis must do for themselves. That's why the linchpin of the strategy was the formation of an inclusive government in Baghdad that could unite the diverse elements of the nation of Iraq to confront the ISIL threat. So we are gratified uh, that, the Ara that Iraq's political leaders have taken the important step uh, of forming this inclusive government. Uh, we hope that they will continue to live up to their promise to govern in an inclusive way and make sure that every Iraqi citizen all across that country feels like the central government in, in Baghdad is looking out for their best interests. We believe that will have a corresponding impact, a positive impact, uh, on the capacity of Iraq's security forces to fight for and defend that entire country. Uh, and we are confident that uh, that is the right strategy. Uh, and the reason the President has been clear about that is, first, he believes that it's important to be transparent with the American public, as transparent as possible, about what our strategy is and what our strategy isn't. Uh, it's also important for the Iraqis to understand that the American military is not going to swoop in and save them. The, 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 Americans, uh, the American military and the American people uh, are ready to support the Iraqi people uh, as they take the fight to ISIL on the ground in their country. Uh, they can count on being backed up, uh, as they have been for the last couple of months, by American military airstrikes. They can count on the support of the broader international coalition that the President is building. Uh, as I mentioned, President Hollande has indicated a willingness uh, to 
uh, order the French military to carry out airstrikes in Iraq too. That would be done in close coordination with the broader international coalition and in support uh, of the effort by Iraqi security forces on the ground uh, in Iraq. So uh, it's important for the American people to understand what our strategy is and what our strategy isn't. It's also important for the Iraqi people and Iraq's political leaders to understand what our strategy is and our strategy isn't. Uh, this, is, this will make it clear to them uh, that they need to step up and take responsibility for the security situation in their own country. On a separate topic, um, and you got a version of this earlier, but uh, is there anything, uh, where, where are the discussions uh, in the administration at this point about the possibility of recognizing an independent Scotland? Uh, well, the, I understand that the vote is actually going on right, right. now. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll let that vote be concluded before we start w delving into the policy implications of yeah, a, either a yes vote or a no vote. Contingencies, treaty contingencies, are these being discussed now, or are you waiting until after the vote? Uh, I'll, uh, if necessary, I'll have more to say about this after the vote, but uh, we'll see. So, John? Josh, just a couple of follow-ups. Uh, okay. First, on the Debbie Wasserman Schultz, mm -hmm. which would be clear, I heard, have you correct, does the President have complete confidence in Debbie Wasserman Schultz as the DNC yes. chair. Uh, I, I ran through her track record. Uh, Again, I'm of just curious. Just it, the, yeah, yeah. The well, I know. Let me just well, looking for the nut graph. Does yeah. he have confidence in her? Yes. Based on record? based on the strong track record of leadership that she has already demonstrated at the DNC, the president has strong uh, confidence in her ability to lead that organization. Okay. And um, uh, back to the uh, uh, campaign operation, whatever you want to call it, against ISIS. Why does the president never use the word war? when describing this? I know you, yeah. we had some back and forth here and you did. eventually used it, but we, we mm -hmm. haven't heard, if I'm correct, uh, we haven't heard him say this is a war. Yeah. Does he consider it a war? Well, um, well yeah, I mean, yes, and based on the position that I have clearly ar articulated, that the United States, uh, in the same way that we're at war with Al Qaeda and their affiliates all around the globe, we're at war with ISIL. But when I say we, it's important for people to understand that I'm talking about the broader international coalition and the international community uh, that's being led by the United States uh, is at war with ISIL. Uh, what the President, uh, when he is describing what we're doing there, uh, is trying to do a couple of things. Uh, the first, obviously, is to be very clear about what our intentions are and what our intentions aren't. Uh, the second is the President has gone to great lengths to try to describe to you and to the American public that the counterterrorism strategy that we are uh, pursuing in Iraq and in Syria is consistent with the counterterrorism strategy that we've used successfully in other places. This is a strategy that's predicated on building up governments, building up the capacity of local forces, backing them up with American military might where necessary to take the fight to extremist organizations on the ground and deny them a safe haven. Now, what's also clear is that this strategy is significantly different than the war that was fought in Iraq uh, earlier uh, uh, in the previous administration principally. Uh, and the President believes that's important for people to understand, too, uh, that, uh, that, again, we do not envision a scenario where there are, is a long column of American tanks rolling across the Iraqi border with the goal of taking and occupying significant swaths of uh, Iraqi territory. So I, I think the effort uh, that you are picking up on uh, is an effort to try to differentiate the strategy that the President is employing in this situation from the strategy that was uh, employed earlier this decade in Iraq. So when the President says there will be no ground troops, there will be no combat troops in Iraq, is that what he means? We won't see columns of American tanks going through Iraq to occupy territory? Because I don't hear anybody actually proposing that. Um, is, is that his well, definition? Is that, where, is that where the line is drawn? So we won't have columns of American tanks and ground troops trying to take over swaths of territory in Iraq? Well, again, I, 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 Is that what he's ruling out? I think, I think the President has been very clear about what he, what he has ruled out, so I'd encourage you to, to, to check his uh, remarks on this topic. Uh, what the President has said is that he is not going to uh, put uh, U.S. military personnel on the ground in Iraq in a combat role. Uh, that, means, uh, that means a variety of things, uh, th but that is the guideline that the President has laid out. It certainly means that there won't be uh, long columns of American tanks rolling across the Iraqi desert trying to take and occupy Iraqi uh, territory. Uh, it also means, let me finish, it also means uh, that we're not going to put uh, American military personnel uh, in a situation where they are uh, responsible for personally and directly engaging the enemy uh, in combat. As uh, the President's been clear that they will be there in an advise and assist role, 
Uh, and there are a variety of ways they can do that. They can do that by serving in the Joint Operations Center and coordinating the efforts of Iraqi and Kurdish security forces and, uh, and integrating them with the broader coalition forces. Uh, there might also be a scenario where uh, American military personnel, again in advisory capacity, could be forward deployed with Iraqi security forces. They would be forward deployed to offer some tactical advice, maybe call in some airstrikes. But again, they would not be in a position where their specific responsibility was to personally or directly engage the enemy in combat. Okay, so that's what I'm getting at. So, you, so the president is not ruling out having U.S. troops based with Iraqi forces on the front lines, based with Iraqi forces, embedded with Iraqi forces that are engaged in combat. He does not rule out having Americans serving side by side with Iraqis in such a position. Well, again, I, I, the forward deployed, the, as you said. I mean, let's, let's yeah, you're trying to describe what I just said, but you're using different words in doing that. Uh, so, what, in terms of trying to understand what our position is, I'd, I'd refer to what I just said. So, I, and I, I say that only because not because I'm trying to be argumentative, but only because um, you and your colleagues are rightly holding us to a high semantic standard. So, uh, in terms of trying to understand what I said, I. Uh, but, but on I this just tried to lay that out. Standard, this, these would be heavily armed American troops. Uh, they, they, they certainly would be, would be. They would be on the front lines. It would be in the line of fire, uh, but their purpose would be to advise the Iraqis and to call in airstrikes. But they would be right in, in the thick of it. No, and the president's not ruling that out. Well, the the president is. Uh, well, let me take let me take this in a, a couple of different forms. The first is. Uh, there have been, the President has ordered additional military personnel to Iraq uh, over the course of the summer, and there have been War Powers notifications filed as it relates to those military deployments. Uh, each of those War Powers notifications indicated that those troops are combat ready, right, that they are armed for combat because they need to protect themselves. Iraq is a very dangerous place right now. Uh, second is, there are already American military personnel that are in the line of fire. Uh, their pilots, their piloting aircraft carrying out airstrikes. Uh, against ISIL positions in Iraq. So the point is, and the President made this point in his remarks at MacDill yesterday, that uh, each of these missions carries with them a risk. Uh, and no one should minimize uh, the risk uh, that our men and women uh, in uniform are taking on uh, in support of this mission. The okay. President certainly doesn't minimize that risk. And just last thing uh, on this high semantic standard. So these would be <laughs> troops who would be serving on the ground. These would be troops wearing boots, I assume. They would be combat ready, and they would be in the line of fire. I'm just trying to see how, how are you not considering these troops that are combat troops? Well, again, John, that in a variety of ways. The first is that they're not responsible for going in and occupying uh, large uh, swaths of Iraqi territory. Uh, they're not in a position where we're certainly not talking about uh, 140 or 150,000 of them. Uh, and we're not talking about their principal responsibility being to directly and personally engage the enemy in combat. Uh, they are not in a combat role. They are in an advise and assist role uh, that, yes, that does carry with it some risk. Uh, but it is different than uh, a, the combat role that American troops were engaged in for such a long time in Iraq. All right. Mike. Um, so two quick questions. On the French airstrikes, mm -hmm. um, is the United States government disappointed that the French, according to President Hollande, apparently ruled out airstrikes in Syria and said that the airstrikes they're willing to participate in are in Iraq only? Uh, and second, has the United States government seen this new video that was released by ISIS today? Mm -hmm. And what's your reaction? To yeah. uh, on the, let me take your second question first. Uh, I have not personally seen the video. I've seen the reports about the video. Uh, our uh, intelligence community is reviewing uh, that video for any information that they can glean uh, that might be uh, uh, useful. Uh, they are they are reviewing that uh, video uh, in coordination with our British allies as well. Uh, but for any additional information or questions, I'd refer you to the UK government on that. Uh, as it relates to the French announcement today, we were uh, gratified to see uh, President Hollande uh, step up and indicate uh, France's role to uh, assume some of the burden of carrying out airstrikes uh, in Iraq. Um, the, uh, as we continue to, to broaden uh, in a systematic way uh, the military campaign against ISIL, including, uh, including uh, mm -hmm. uh, hitting targets in Syria, you know, we'll continue to be in touch with, our, uh, with, our mem with the members of this international coalition uh, as we embark on this effort. But uh, this, this will be an ongoing process, uh, and uh, the announcement from the French today is an important one, uh, that they're going to join, join the U.S. In, uh, in carrying out some of these airstrikes 
uh, in Iraq. But according to my colleagues, I mean, I wasn't there, obviously, but, but to my colleagues there who was at the press conference, he specifically said that these will be limited to Iraq and we're not going into Syria. So this wasn't just an omission of didn't say. He specifically said we're not mm -hmm. going to be participating in, in so are, is there a, an, a sense that the United States government could convince the French to go further at some point in the well, future? Well, I'm certainly not going to speak for the, uh, the commander in chief of the French military for what steps the French military is prepared to take. Uh, but the effort to build this coalition uh, is an ongoing one, and we're going to continue to consult with our allies and partners about what role they can play to contribute to this broader international coalition to uh, degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Mara? A question about Ukraine. You said it's in your interest in making sure that the Ukrainian military doesn't get overrun. Mm -hmm. Is that your description of the current state of the military conflict in Ukraine, that they are not being overrun? Well, I'm not a, a military analyst, uh, but I do think that based on my uh, basic understanding of the situation on the ground there, I, I, I don't see any evidence that they have been overrun. That's what you're asking. So, so, I mean, but that you describe that as kind of a satisfactory state. I mean, obviously, the well, I don't think I, thinks I don't think I use that word. I don't okay, think I well, describe so it that this way. Isn't, so the current military situation is not satisfactory to you. Well, what, what we what would be satisfactory to the United States is the full implementation of the ceasefire agreement uh, and the beginning of negotiations that would eventually resolve the differences between uh, the Ukrainian central government and the separatists. Right, I get that, but. Mm -hmm. Poroshenko clearly feels that his current military situation is untenable without lethal military aid from the U.S., more than night goggles. And um, you've decided that the milita lethal military aid is not necessary to achieve the goal of getting a diplomatic solution. And we're trying to figure out why, since you have a difference of opinion between the White House yeah. and the Ukrainian government. Yeah. I'm sure you didn't intend it this way, oh. but I, I wouldn't describe our uh, military assistance to the Ukrainians is just night, ga night goggles. I mean, over the course of this well, year, more than... Delayed. Right. So the, we're talking about $100 million in security okay. assistance, more than $100 million has been provided to them. This includes body armor, helmets, right, vehicles, right. So he night wants. and thermal vision devices, heavy engineering equipment, advanced radios, demining equipment, portable explosive ordnance disposable, disposal robots, patrol boats, <laughs> rations, tents, counter mortar radars. <laughs> So a bunch of stuff. That's my that's my point. That that our that our assistance that we have provided to the Ukrainian military is extensive. Okay, do you believe that that assistance and the new stuff you're giving them now is going to create a situation that will get Russia to do what you want it to do at the negotiating table? You know, come and and negotiate a ceasefire. Do you believe that this assistance is going to do the trick? Well, what we believe is that the it is clearly in the interests uh, of the international community for nations all around the globe to respect the basic territorial integrity of other nations. This is a, this is a criti he's not doing that. Well, this is a critically important international norm, uh, and the United, the United States, in conjunction with our partners in Europe, uh, have taken significant action to impose costs on Russia for their failure to observe that basic international norm. In fact, they haven't just failed to observe it, they've flagrantly violated it. Uh, and uh, as long as Russia continues to violate that norm, they will put themselves at risk of being further isolated uh, and sustaining further costs to their economy. Uh, but ultimately, it will be the decision of President Putin uh, to decide what is in the best interests of Russia. Uh, but right now, for the instability that they're fomenting in this region of the world, their economy has taken a hit. Not a big enough hit to get them to the negotiating table. But I have one last question. There's a, mo there are, there's a model for this well, conflict. Uh, let me uh, uh, say one thing about that. We believe that it's the separatists who should be at the negotiating table with the Ukrainian central government. But, okay, well they, but, I, I, they, but I understand your point. Yes, okay. but I understand your but, point. But there's a model for this, which is in Georgia and Moldova, where the Bush administration gave a certain amount of aid to these countries, but not enough to prevent what's called a frozen conflict, where Russia just destabilizes them enough that they don't control all their territory, and they don't need to take over these countries lock, stock, and barrel. Mm -hmm. They just need to keep them in this frozen conflict state. Is that the model for what you're doing with Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova? Well, no. What, what, what we would like to see in Ukraine is Ukraine be able to make the kinds of decisions that reflect the will of the Ukrainian people. Uh, we believe that they can do that in a way that reflects uh, the strong ties uh, that already exist between Ukraine uh, and Russia, uh, and that strengthening Ukraine's ties with the West uh, through the signing of association agreements and other strong uh, economic ties should in no way have an impact on the ability of Ukraine to have a strong and fruitful relationship uh, with Russia as well. Okay. Cheryl. Yeah, thanks. 
Um, next week, the president is going to be attending the UN Climate Summit, uh, but the leaders, the top leaders of China and India are not going to be attending. Have you had to lower your expectations for that summit because of that? Well, we'll have more to say uh, about the uh, activities at the United Nations possibly as early as tomorrow. The, but we are looking forward to uh, this meeting. There's a lot of important work uh, that's going to get done in New York next week. Uh, and some of it will involve um, uh, bringing along the international community uh, in terms of coordinating in an effort uh, to reduce the causes of, uh, uh, of climate change and of, of carbon pollution. So we'll have more on that next week. I, I don't anticipate that uh, the fact that the heads of state of those two countries not being there uh, will have any impact on our ability to uh, to advance the ball on this uh, on this priority, okay, yeah. Jerome. Yes, uh, uh, speaking for of Congress, President Poroshenko just asked explicitly the United States to grant Ukraine a special security status as a non-NATO ally. Is the United States ready to grant uh, Ukraine this status? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not uh, familiar with that specific request, Jerome. So I'll have to take that question. Okay, Roger. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you give us an update on the airstrike uh, decisions? The options, uh, is the President considering them? Has he gotten them? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, what kind of role will he play in, uh, in the airstrikes? Will he give the military a long leash or a short leash? Well, um, that's probably not an analogy that I'll repeat. The, uh, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, let's, let me say it this way. The President did have uh, uh, a briefing uh, with his top military leaders at CENTCOM yesterday at McDill Air Force Base. Uh, the President described that briefing as thorough. He was pleased uh, with the work that has been done by his military planners uh, as they develop uh, options and plans related to his order uh, that he's prepared to, um, to broaden out uh, military action in that region of the world. Uh, they would, they would uh, broaden out this uh, military uh, operation uh, in a way that would uh, further our effort to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL, but uh, as I uh, mentioned with John and others, that it would not include uh, putting American uh, troops on the ground in Iraq and Syria to, to carry out a combat role. Uh, but this is part of an ongoing process, uh, and the uh, update that the President received uh, at CENTCOM uh, was useful. Uh, and it did reflect a lot of work that has been going on for quite some time at the Pentagon, uh, but that work uh, is still ongoing. Uh, and I don't have any uh, announcements to make about uh, decisions that the Commander in Chief has made at this point. Uh, as it relates to um, uh, what sort of ongoing communication will uh, exist uh, between the Commander in Chief and the military as they carry out this campaign, uh, what I would say is that the um, what I would say is that the – what we have seen so far in Iraq over the course of the last month or so uh, is an indication uh, that the President is prepared to lay out guidelines for his military planners and his military commanders uh, who can then uh, carry out the actions that they believe are necessary within the confines uh, of those guidelines. Uh, what Chairman Dempsey referred to at one point during his testimony earlier this week uh, was the President's desire to review uh, certain elements of that plan on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, what Chairman Dempsey was referring to uh, was this question that John and I were discussing, which is the possible forward deployment uh, of American military advisors with Iraqi security forces. Uh, again, Chairman Dempsey did not raise the prospect that those American uh, military personnel would be in a combat role. They would not, because the President would not approve that. What the President would consider, however, is the forward deployment of these of this personnel, of these advisors, to uh, offer uh, tactical assistance to Iraqi security forces and, uh, if necessary, call in airstrikes in support uh, of their ground operations. So that is something that the President said that he would uh, – that he wanted to reserve the option uh, of considering those requests on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but more generally, the President has laid out for his military uh, 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 commanders clear guidelines for executing the mission that he has ordered, uh, and the military is, is carrying out those, those, this op these operations uh, within the guidelines of, the, of, the, uh, of what the President has ordered. So there's no airstrike decisions yet, and we shouldn't expect them to be imminent or anything? Uh, well, um, 
Uh, I'm not uh, right in Syria. Yeah, I was trying to decide whether you're talking about the Iraq thing or Syria. Uh, we we have we have indicated that we are uh, that the president is ready to order additional uh, or ready to order uh, airstrikes in Syria uh, at a time and place of his choosing. And I, I don't want to be in a position of telegraphing uh, those plans in advance at this point. No. Major, just to pinpoint that because the journal says this morning that the president wants to be in the position to <laughs> authorize each and every run in Syria once he orders it. True yeah. or not true? Not true. Why is that not true? Because the, what the president has done in Iraq and what he will do in Syria is lay out clear guidelines for what uh, the president envisions for uh, our military planning, uh, and he will authorize uh, uh, authorize or you know put in place guidelines uh, that the military can use to carry out these operations. Uh, Did the president communicate that yesterday at McDill? Say that, that once I give you the guidelines, you're free to go. Well, I'm not going to. I don't want to characterize the conversations between the president and the military planners. But let me just say that this is consistent with the air campaign that the military has been conducting in Iraq. That there are more than 160 airstrikes that have been carried out in Iraq. The president did not sign off on each of those 160 airstrikes individually. Rather, he presented guidelines. And he won't in Syria. Uh, that's correct. Okay. I want to ask you about something that we reported this morning uh, about a threat that I'm curious if the president has been briefed on, and to what degree he is knowledgeable about it. It's a group that is related to al-Qaeda called Khorasan. And we have reported that at dozens of airports, US-bound passengers are undergoing enhanced screening. Security agents are looking for hidden explosives. Uncharged laptops and phones are banned from flights because this particular group is trying to create an even more sophisticated way to smuggle explosives on planes. And this could be a more immediate threat than what is currently dominating a tremendous amount of policy and headlines meaning ISIL or ISIS. Can you tell us anything about what the President knows about this, the degree to which his counterterrorism officials are on this? Uh, you're asking me about a, uh, an intelligence issue, obviously. So there's, uh, I'm limited in what I can say. But uh, what I can tell you is that our intelligence professionals have long spoken about the host of terror threats that are emanated from, emanating from Syria. Uh, you've also heard me discuss quite a bit about the challenges posed by foreign terrorist fighters. And next week, you'll hear directly from the President when he chairs a UN Security Council session uh, on this very topic. Uh, at the same time, I'm not in a position to provide granular detail from here uh, about specific threats or potential cells that may be operating uh, and seeking to uh, carry out attacks against American interests. Um, frankly, doing so would be counterproductive to our whole of government approach to countering this challenge. Uh, well, let me just add to that by saying generally uh, that the Obama administration and that our, and our law enforcement and national security professionals uh, remain vigilant uh, about threats that are emanating from Syria uh, and other places around the globe. Uh, and this requires the constant evaluation of our security posture. Uh, it often will require the, uh, the, the, the tweaking of our security posture to change certain elements in a way that would strengthen our defenses in one area. Uh, and sometimes these changes to our uh, homeland security posture are pretty evident to the traveling public, and sometimes they aren't. Uh, but we remain vigilant uh, about the threats that uh, continue to emanate from uh, Al Qaeda and their affiliates all around the globe. Okay. Uh, just to get back to Poroshenko for a moment, because he said we can't keep the peace with blankets and we can't win the war with blankets. Understanding that you believe the United States is providing more than blankets. There's prominent members of the Democratic Senate, Carl Levin, chief among them, who urged this president in this White House to provide lethal arms. Is that something you are ruling out permanently? Well, uh, for a, a substantial national security decision like that, I'd, I'd let the president make that decision. So I'm certainly not going to do that from here. Uh, but we have provided substantial security assistance uh, to the Ukrainian military, uh, and that reflects uh, our commitment to the Ukrainian people. people. But just slightly. Uh, well, again, I, the characterization of whether or not this is something we might do in the future, ruling out that we would do something like this in the future is, would be something that um, uh, the President would do, not me. Okay. Josh, yeah. uh, I know you don't want to telegraph when airstrikes will start, but in an open forum today, Secretary Hagel did tell the, the uh, House, I believe it was, um, that he and General Dempsey have approved Syrian airstrike plans and they were presented to the President yesterday down in Tampa. Is that accurate? Uh, the President did uh, review uh, in a briefing with his uh, military planners at CENTCOM uh, some of the plans that they have developed uh, as it relates to the order that he has said he's prepared to, uh, uh, to issue uh, to broaden our airstrike campaign into Syria 
to deny a safe haven to ISIL. It is a core principle of this presidency to uh, ensure, to, to actively deny a safe haven to those individuals or organizations that seek to do harm to the United States or our homeland. Uh, so uh, this is something that our military planners at the Pentagon have been hard at work on for quite some time now. Uh, the President uh, described the briefing that he received from them as thorough. Uh, he was pleased with the solid work that they've been uh, doing. Uh, I did not sit in on the – I don't want to say this in a way that leads you to believe that I sat in on the briefing. I did not. Uh, I did have the opportunity but to speak to the President. The chain of command, I guess, is the point. That Secretary Hagel, General Dempsey, top two military advisors, have at least approved airstrike plans, they say, and now it's on the President's desk. Well, I, I don't want to uh, characterize I, – I didn't see the Secretary's remarks, so I don't want to be in a position of characterizing what the Secretary or the Chairman has signed off on. Uh, what I can tell you is that the President is um, – uh, was pleased to have the opportunity to review uh, the hard work that's been underway at the Pentagon for quite some time and to consider uh, those detailed plans that were uh, put forward uh, before him. Uh, and he was pleased with their work. Uh, but their, their work uh, is ongoing and continues. Uh, the other work that they're, hard, that they're uh, engaged in is – uh, building this broader international coalition. And the President had the opportunity to meet with the senior national representatives uh, of other governments uh, who are co-located with CENTCOM. Uh, these governments are uh, some of the regional governments that could potentially contribute to a broader international coalition. So uh, I just raise that to uh, make sure that, um, that everybody understands that CENTCOM is not just responsible for uh, doing this kind of military planning and presenting options to the President. They're also actively engaged uh, in the effort to uh, coordinate with uh, regional governments about the role that they could play in a broader international coalition. I'll go back to Darlene's question at the beginning about sequencing uh, in terms of Syria and airstrikes. When General Dempsey tells the AP that it could take at least three months to train the Syrian rebels, can airstrikes move forward in Syria? before the rebels are trained, since the President, a key part of his strategy is U.S. airstrikes coupled with the rebels being the ground troops to fight ISIS on the ground. Can you do one without the other? Well, I would um, – I think the short answer to that is yes, uh, because the President has announced his intention to take uh, – to broaden out the military airstrikes. And then – Right. Uh, in a way that would succeed in degrading uh, the ability of ISIL to um, – uh, well, degrading the capacity of ISIL. So that can be done by uh, ordering airstrikes on, uh, uh, on the front end uh, before there is a fully uh, trained and equipped uh, security force on the ground to take the fight to them. Uh, but what we've been clear about at the, from – you know, for quite some time now, and as you've heard from our military planners, uh, it will require boots on the ground uh, to take the fight to ISIL on the ground in Syria. That is the way that we can – uh, ensure that we are effective in denying them a safe haven in Syria. But certainly the use of American and allied uh, military airstrikes would have uh, an effect, even a substantial effect, on degrading the capacity of ISIL. On boots on the ground, how do you, the President, how do you react when his former Secretary of Defense, uh, Bob Gates, says you can't win, you can't destroy ISIS without having U.S. combat troops on the ground? Well, I think that's consistent with what I just said, that it is going to require uh, combat boots on the ground to take the fight to ISIL in Iraq and in You're Syria. suggesting U.S., well, I, not I don't, the I don't, Syrian rebels. I didn't see the entirety of his remarks. I'm not sure that that's exactly what he well, was implying. The President is putting himself in a trap, so it didn't sound like he was saying count on the Syrian rebels. He well, said the President's headed for a trap. There is a basic strategy that the President has laid out, and it does include um, boots on the ground. The question is, whose boots on the ground is it going to be? It, they are not going to be U.S. boots on the ground uh, engaged in combat operations in Iraq and Syria. What we can do and what the President believes we should do uh, is ramp up the assistance that we provide to Iraqi and Kurdish security forces, ramp up the assistance that we provide to the Syrian opposition so that they can take the fight on the ground to ISIL in their own countries. Okay, last one on that point, your exchange with John. If U.S. troops are forward deployed, as you say, alongside Iraqi troops giving tactical guidance, and, and these U.S. troops are fired upon by ISIS. Are the U.S. troops to do nothing? Uh, U.S. troops will have uh, rules of engagement. They always do when they enter a situation well, like this. They fire back at ISIS? And again, I'm not going to detail that th those rules of engagement. The Department of Defense can do that for you. Uh, but certainly the Commander in Chief would expect that uh, the American troops uh, do what is necessary to defend themselves. Uh, that so would, they would be, be in combat. That if would they're be defending themselves and they're firing back during combat. Well, uh, Ed, as I described earlier, the 
principal responsibility of these American troops uh, would not be to personally or directly engage the enemy in combat. Not their principal responsibility, but they can be drawn into combat as a point. Uh, no, that's not how I would describe it. it here's, here's, this is another, I think, useful data point. This strategy that the President has laid out, this counterterrorism strategy that involves on occasion of the forward deployment of some uh, military personnel who are not engaged in combat operations, is consistent with the counterterrorism strategy that we've used in other places. But they're on uh, the ground and they're in a combat zone. Or are you saying they're in some other area? Uh, is it well, I think it, I think it will depend, uh, you know, it will depend on exactly what the scenario is, uh, exactly how far uh, so how, you know how for far sure that they're deployed. not in combat if you have to figure out what the scenario is. Again, My question is more, if, if you have the Iraqi soldiers there fighting ISIS, who, we, who the President has called these awful terrorists, and they're firing upon them, that sounds like a combat zone that U.S. troops are in. Uh, Iraq is a very dangerous place, uh, and American military personnel will have the equipment that they need to defend themselves. Uh, but what, they, what their role will be, and this is what's really important for people to understand, their role will not be to roll across the border in a long line of tanks to occupy significant territory in Iraq. Their role will be to provide uh, advice uh, and assistance to Iraqi security forces who are taking the fight on the ground uh, against ISIL. In some cases, that could mean being on the ground in four deployed locations to call in That's airstrikes. Not your role at first, but when you're but in a combat zone, your role can change, right? Isn't that what General Dempsey is suggesting? Your role can change. Well, I, I think the environment in which you're operating could change, uh, but, their, but their role specifically would be to offer advice and assistance to the Iraqi security forces who are taking the fight on the ground to ISIL. Chris. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I want to go back to what General Dempsey said about the timeline and three to four months to begin this training program and then a year perhaps to get them ready to uh, actually uh, be ready for action. And in terms of these troops who are American troops combat ready, but not combat troops. And the threat to the region, threat to the United States that the President expressed when he gave his uh, remarks, in this interim year, given how key they are to his strategy, does the threat to all of them, including those U.S. troops, escalate? Well, Chris, there are already a number of things that we uh, can do to try to address this situation. The first is we already have been, for over a year, been providing uh, assistance, both military and non-military assistance, to the Syrian opposition. So there already is the, a relationship that exists uh, between uh, the U.S. and some of these groups that are fighting ISIL uh, in Syria. Uh, I think what Chairman Dempsey again was referring to but was the that specific of time we've seen their gains grow, their strength grow, their uh, their cash reserves grow. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have also seen, and I think what we'll continue to see in the months ahead, as uh, the relationship between the opposition fighters in the United States becomes solidified as they get additional equipment, as they get additional training, as they get additional experience fighting ISIL. I do anticipate that we will see their performance improve. Uh, I also would anticipate that as ISIL forces uh, are subjected to American military uh, and or allied uh, airstrikes uh, in Syria, that that will degrade their capacity and performance on the battlefield as well. So I think the point here is that what the President envisions in this broadened, systematic uh, air campaign uh, is the deployment of American and allied uh, air, uh, air power uh, to degrade ISIL. That is going to have an impact on their ability to operate. Uh, it will have an impact both in the, in, in the context of their uh, physical equipment uh, being degraded. Uh, it also will uh, add another element that, they, that ISIL fighters need to be worried about. Uh, right now, uh, the reason that we are concerned about this situation is that ISIL is essentially operating in a virtual safe haven. Uh, once there are uh, American warplanes and allied warplanes flying overhead, uh, that will, Syria, or at least that region of Syria, will no longer be uh, a safe haven from which ISIL is able to freely operate and coordinate attacks uh, in Iraq, uh, and certainly uh, would make it much harder for them to uh, contemplate uh, carrying out uh, attacks against the U.S. homeland. Let me just reiterate that at this point, we are the, our intelligence community assesses that we're not aware of any active plotting uh, against the U.S. homeland. Uh, but if we were to allow this safe haven to persist, uh, it's not hard to imagine that, uh, that ISIL could, in fact, uh, turn their attention to plotting against the U.S. homeland. Uh, that is why the President has ordered uh, this broadened air campaign as part of this coordinated strategy uh, to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. 
the president's speech, you said the president would welcome any show of support uh, from Congress, and, and the vote, as you know, from the House was 273 to 156, but 40 percent of Democrats uh, opposed it. Uh, there's expected to be a split as well in the Senate. Is that the show of support that the White House was hoping for? Well, Chris, we certainly are very pleased to have seen a majority of Republicans and a majority of Democrats come together in the House of Representatives in support of a proposal that the President considers a top priority. Uh, that doesn't happen very often these days in Washington, D.C., and we were pleased uh, to see members of Congress uh, put aside partisan labels uh, and actually focus on uh, this core priority. Uh, there are Democrats and Republicans. Of the Democrats uh, voting to oppose the President um, is the show of support that sends a message that there is a unified uh, show of support? I think the fact that, again, a majority of Republicans and a majority of Democrats in a very uh, divided House of Representatives uh, is a strong show of support to the American people, to the international community, and to our enemies that the United States is determined uh, to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Uh, that is an important show of support for the President's strategy. Uh, and uh, like I said, this is a, uh, a testament to the willingness of members of Congress, uh, even those who voted against it, to put aside their partisan labels, to carefully consider uh, the proposal in front of them, and vote their conscience. Uh, and uh, that is uh, that is, that is the responsibility of elected members of Congress. Uh, but in this case, I believe that they deserve credit for uh, faithfully executing that responsibility. And I just want to try really quickly to phrase differently something that's already been asked about um, the meeting with President Poroshenko. Okay. Uh, and I know you're not going to want to put words in the President's mouth, but what does he say to him when he asks specifically for lethal aid? What's the, ar what's the succinct argument for why the U.S. will not provide that? Well, uh, you'll have an opportunity to hear from the two presidents about their meeting. I, I, I don't want to prejudge on the front end that that's something that President uh, Poroshenko will directly raise himself in the Oval Office with the president. So uh, you'll have an opportunity to hear from the two of them after their meeting, uh, and you'll get a sense of uh, what their discussion was like. Okay? Mr. Vaquera. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so uh, apparently ISIL has made military gains in the last 24 to 48 hours in northern Syria against Kurdish forces, in other words, non-Assad forces. What, are military gains like that, uh, is that a concern of the White House? Are they in, addressed under the President's new policy? Is that a potential uh, instigation, or does it meet the threshold for new uh, for airstrikes against ISIS? Well, Mike, I haven't, I haven't seen those reports, but certainly the goal of uh, degrading and ultimately destroying ISIL uh, would uh, involve reducing their capacity uh, to make military gains. Uh, so even in the short term, when we're talking about you know, the President's been pretty clear that ultimately destroying ISIL is, a, uh, is not a short-term proposition. Uh, but what we do think that we can do uh, in the relative near term uh, is to have an impact on degrading uh, the capacity of ISIL to launch military operations in Syria or, uh, or in Iraq. Uh, that is, after all, the reason that the President has ordered this uh, uh, broadening of our military campaign. It also would serve to uh, deny them uh, a safe haven. And so I, I guess to answer your question, again, without having seen the reports that you're referring to, uh, the effort to degrade ISIL in the short term, uh, we would expect, would have the effect of reducing their capacity to make military gains. Okay. Um, on this forward deployment of, of uh, <coughs> advisors, would you characterize them as advisors that if they were potentially forwardly deployed to call in airstrikes, they're, they're advisors? Correct? Well, uh, I think the President has described uh, these as military personnel in an advise and assist capacity. There are now 1,600, give or take, American military personnel mm -hmm. in Iraq in that capacity. Is there an That's upper right. limit to that number? Well, uh, if, there, if there were an upper limit to that number, the President would set it. I can tell you that the President does not envision anything even approaching uh, the kind of sustained uh, on-the-ground military presence that was responsible for occupying Iraq uh, a decade ago. Uh, but what the President does envision uh, are uh, American military personnel working closely with uh, Iraqi and Kurdish security forces, as they are now, uh, to uh, integrate the, uh, the contributions of the international coalition uh, and the ground offensives of the Iraqi and Kurdish security forces to take the fight to ISIL. So there's an important role that American military personnel uh, are on the ground and already playing uh, in Iraq. Finally, what you've seen on the Hill over the last few days is a lot of concern from members about um, the role of the neighboring states. The President and other officials made a big deal about Arab nations joining the coalition. Sec uh, Senator Corker, I think, yesterday called them uh, potential code holders. 
Um, you haven't revealed the exact role that many of these nations are going to play. Today, Secretary Hager said the perception that this is not, not just an American enterprise is very important. If it's a perception issue, when are you going to come forward with some specific information about what Arab nations are contributing uh, to the coalition? Yeah. Uh, well, Mike, the one thing that I would refer you to is I would refer you to the uh, JEDA communique that came out last week, uh, that there's some pretty stark language in there that indicates the commitment of uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, uh, and Lebanon to this broader effort. Uh, they agreed to do their share in the comprehensive fight against ISIL. That included stopping the flow of foreign fighters, countering financing of ISIL, repudiating their hateful ideology, uh, ending impunity and bringing perpetrators to justice. Uh, assisting with the reconstruction and rehabilitation of communities brutalized by ISIL, uh, and as appropriate, joining in the many aspects of a coordinated military campaign against ISIL. I think that is a pretty strong declaration from some of these Arab countries of their support for this broader international coalition. I guess my point is, you don't have to take my word for it. You can look at the communique that they've uh, signed their names to to indicate their commitment uh, to this broader international effort. Okay. All right, we'll do one more. Chris? Uh, thanks, Josh. House Democrats yesterday launched a discharge permission to compel a vote on the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. Does the President support those efforts? Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, I can tell you the President has long supported inclusive federal legislation to address employment discrimination against LGBT Americans, uh, and we continue to believe that Congress needs to act. Uh, we welcome efforts to move this issue forward and will work with lawmakers and advocates to achieve this important goal. You'll recall, Chris, that the President uh, has acted using his executive authority to try to take some steps to uh, end employment discrimination against uh, uh, LBGT Americans. Uh, so this is clearly a principle that we support uh, and we welcome uh, congressional action in this area. The language associated with this version of ENDA has a narrower religious exemption along the lines of Title VII of the, 1960, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That's uh, narrower than the uh, language in the Senate passed bill. Does the President prefer the language in the version that's associated with the Justice tradition or wants the uh, Senate passed language? Well, I do know that this is the subject of ongoing conversations between uh, White House officials, senior administration officials, and, uh, and interested members of Congress who've been focused on, uh, on, these, uh, on these issues. Uh, so I don't want to characterize those conversations at this point, but uh, this is, generally speaking, a, uh, a value that the President supports uh, and encourages Congress uh, to act on it. Those, those conversations right now? Uh, because, they're, because they're ongoing, and so uh, we'll let those conversations continue in private. Do you anticipate the President will reach out to members of Congress to encourage them to sign the discharge petition? Uh, I don't have any specific calls to read out from the President at this point, but I certainly wouldn't rule out conversations along those lines. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody.